All right. We're going to finish up right now quickly chapter 14, and we'll turn to 15. I'll have a, a bit to say about that in introducing 15. But in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, I see silence, your phone, okay. Uh, the end of 1 Corinthians 14 in verses 27 to 28, Paul regulates the exercise of tongues, the gift of tongues in the assembly in light of the importance of upbuilding the church or edifying the church. And then in 29 to 36, he regulates the exercise of the gift of prophecy. Verses 33b, the second part of 33 through 35, make clear that women are not to participate in the prophetic process. They're not to prophesy or weigh, orally challenge the prophecies delivered by others. And this is in keeping with uh, what he says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Then Paul, he finishes chapter 14, 37 to 40, says, If anyone thinks he's a prophet or is spiritual, let him acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is a command of the Lord. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So then, my brothers, be enthusiastic about the prophesying, and do not forbid the speaking in tongues, but let all things be done properly and according to order. So 37 to 40, this forms the conclusion of the section that he began in 1426, in verse 37 and 38, Paul admonishes those who consider themselves prophets or to be spiritual, those to whom his corrective measures specifically apply, he admonishes them to recognize that what he has written, these regulations on how you're to exercise these gifts, he wants them to recognize that what he's written is a command of the Lord and to act accordingly. And those who refuse to do so, those who rebel against the command of the Lord will not be recognized by the Lord. So that's pretty serious. And then in 39 and 40, he sums up the discussion of prophecy in tongues that he's been having through 14 by reducing it to a simple principle. He says, be enthusiastic about prophecy and accept tongue speaking, but as with everything in the assembly, do them in a fitting and orderly way. So he's been talking about that throughout. Now we get to chapter 15, where Paul here, I want to do a little detour. It's really not a detour. It functions as an introduction to the chapter. But it's not, we're not going to be looking at the text for a while. Now, this entire chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is devoted to correcting a view that some in the Corinthian church held. This view that the dead will not be resurrected. And that this, is the, that this is the issue, the fundamental issue of the chapter. It's clear from verse 12 of chapter 15 where Paul says, But if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is not a resurrection of the dead? Now in denying that there is a resurrection of the dead, the Corinthians were not denying that the spirit or soul of people continued to exist after death. That is not what they're denying. Rather, they're denying that the dead would return to bodily life. That is what resurrection meant in the ancient world. The renowned New Testament scholar, theologian N.T. Wright, he describes the ancient understanding of the term resurrection. In his book, Surprised by Hope, he says, within this world, within the ancient Greco-Roman world, he says, the word resurrection in its Greek, Latin, or other equivalents was never used to mean life after death. Resurrection was used to denote new bodily life after whatever sort of life after death there might be. So there was life after death in that the soul or spirit continued to exist after death, but that's not what resurrection is. Resurrection is the restoration of bodily life after life after death. So that's what he'll talk about. That's the phrase. You see this two-step thing of there's life after death, but resurrection is life after life after death. All right, he goes on. He says, when the ancients spoke of resurrection... 
whether to deny it, as all pagans did, or to affirm it, as some Jews did, they were referring to a two-step narrative in which resurrection, meaning new bodily life, would be preceded by an interim period of bodily death. That's the the two-step thing I just said to you. It's life after, life after death. Resurrection wasn't then a dramatic or vivid way of talking about the state people went into immediately after death. That was death. That was the continuation of the soul or spirit. That's not resurrection. Right continues. It denoted something. Resurrection denoted something that might happen, though almost everyone thought it wouldn't. All of the pagans thought it wouldn't. Some of the Jews thought it wouldn't, but most did. It denoted something that might happen, though almost everyone thought it wouldn't, sometime after that. Sometime after life after death. After the continuing of the soul or spirit after death. This meaning is constant throughout the ancient world until the post-Christian coinages of 2nd century Gnosticism. You remember the heretics of the 2nd century and beyond? Gnostics? They're the ones who started to morph resurrection into something that it never meant. Most of the ancients believed in life after death. Some of them developed complex and fascinating beliefs about it, which we've just touched on. But outside Judaism and Christianity, and perhaps Zoroastrianism, though the the dating of that is controversial, they did not believe in resurrection. In content, resurrection referred specifically to something that happened to the body. Hence the later debates about how God would do this, whether he would start with the existing bones or make new ones or whatever. One would have debates like that only if it was clear that what you ended up with was something tangible and physical. Everybody knew about ghosts, spirits, visions, hallucinations, and so on. Most people in the ancient world believed in some such things. They were quite clear that that wasn't what they meant by resurrection. Resurrection meant bodies. We cannot emphasize this too strongly, not least because much modern writing continues most misleadingly to use the word resurrection as a virtual synonym for life after death in the popular sense. In other words, he's saying that in popular writing, you got people talking about resurrection as though it's simply the continuation of the soul or spirit, and that is not resurrection. Okay, that is not what resurrection is, is not what it was in the ancient world. So if an ancient writer, given this meaning and this understanding of resurrection, if an ancient writer intended to use resurrection as a metaphor for something other than restoration of bodily life, that writer would need to signal or indicate that intention to use it metaphorically. You see, otherwise he'd be understood to be using the word normally to be using the word non-metaphorically, which is clearly how Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now it's also helpful, I think, as we look through this, it's helpful to, to note that in denying the resurrection of the dead, the Corinthians were not denying expressly that Jesus had been raised from the dead. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, And with with verse 11, Paul makes it clear that they accepted the truth of Jesus' resurrection when he preached the gospel to them. So they're not denying that, at least not denying it expressly. They were denying that others, mere humans, those who were not God incarnate, would likewise be resurrected. See, some were saying that there is not a resurrection of the dead ones, plural. They were denying a general resurrection. And Paul tells them, as we will see, that the two go together. That the two are coupled, so that to deny the one is to deny the other implicitly. So they're not expressly denying Jesus' resurrection. They believe that and accepted it. They're denying the resurrection of other people. And Paul will tell them that in denying the one, you are implicitly denying the other. And so it's important to recognize that. Now, as indicated in that quote from Wright, in the ancient pagan world, the ancient pagan world, you had some people who denied that there was any kind of life after death. In other words, they believed that existence simply terminated when you died. 
what I call the worm food school. You just die and that's it. But most pagans, most pagans, those in the ancient world, they believed in some sort of life after death. They believed in a continuing spiritual existence, that a person's soul or spirit continued to exist after death. Now, those who believe that, that majority of pagans who believe that, they did not believe in resurrection. See, that, that's not something that they accepted. Rather, they thought that death was a one-way street to a disembodied existence. So that was the dominant view of the pagan world. Greeks, Romans, most of them thought that when you died, your soul or spirit continued to exist, but they denied resurrection. There was no return to bodily uh, existence, bodily uh, resurrection. See, some were saying that, that, you know, that this idea, there's no return to that. The restoration of bodily life. As I say, for them, it was just this one-way street. You die and you live forever as a soul or a spirit. That's why when Paul preached about Jesus and the resurrection in Athens, in Acts chapter 17, verse 18. That's another Greek city, by the way, just about 65 miles from Corinth. When Paul preached there about Jesus and the resurrection, some who heard him, they mocked him. They mocked him, that idea. They just said, look, that's crazy. And you see a similar sense of incredulity. You see that existed among some Corinthian Christians. They had brought this over with them from their pagan perspective. And you see that it's evident in the two questions that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 15, 35. These two questions express the crux of the problem that resurrection posed for the Greek mindset. How are the dead raised? With what sort of body do they come? Now as I say, among the pagans you have those who say you simply terminate. The majority of pagans say no, you continue forever as a disembodied spirit. Within Judaism, among the Jews, you see those same two ideas expressed. The Sadducees, for example, they believe that upon death you simply terminate. You had other Jews like Philo, the first century, century philosopher, who thought like most pagans. He thought that no, when you die, you continue forever as a disembodied spirit. But the difference between the pagans and the Jews is that most first century Jews, most first century Jews, they believed that God would raise his people bodily from the dead on the last day the day on which he judged and remade the world. Now just so you'll know, I'm not making that up. James Ware, in his 2014 article in the journal New Testament Studies, he says, to be sure, it is beyond controversy. So what I'm telling you is not the least bit controversial. It is beyond controversy that belief in the restoration to life of the flesh and bones body was the general or dominant view held by most first century Jews. So this is where we were. Now, that belief that God is going to bodily raise his people at the end, at the last day when he judged and remade the world, that is what's behind Martha's statement in John eleven twenty four, where she says she knows her dead brother Lazarus will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. You see it in the Sadducees reference to the resurrection. They don't believe it. But you remember when they're posing this hypothetical to Jesus, they say, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? You see, that, you see that understanding of Jewish ideas about the resurrection? It's evident in Paul's play to the Pharisees in Acts 23, 6, that he was on trial with respect to the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And it's evident in his statement in Acts 24, 15, that his accusers from Jerusalem, that they accept the hope that there will be a resurrection of the just and unjust. See, so this was standard Jewish belief. Now, I regret to say that far too many in the church today continue this Corinthian denial of the resurrection. Far too many continue this denial of the resurrection. They continue to insist 
that Christians will spend eternity as disembodied spirits, as souls, as non-physical beings in a non-physical realm known as heaven. But that is not the biblical picture. For now, we do exist as disembodied spirits in heaven, but that's only a temporary or an intermediate state that is not how we will spend eternity. Our eternal existence will be in resurrected bodies in a transformed physical creation, a heavenized creation, what is called the new heavens and new earth, which will come about at Christ's return. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25, he makes clear there that creation itself will be freed from its bondage to decay. The bondage to which it was subjected at the fall. All of creation has been tied up in the consequences of sin. And creation's on its tiptoe, looking and waiting for the redemption of mankind, and it will share in that. That is what Paul says in Romans 8. See, God's good creation will be reaffirmed. It will not be abandoned. Now, I know from past experience, I've taught this for many, many years, and I know from past experience that what I'm saying will strike some of you as novel or eccentric, something some of you may even think is doctrinally suspect. But I assure you, it is not. It is not. The belief that Christians will be raised bodily, physically from the dead, is without question the historic, orthodox Christian view. It has been part of the Christian faith from the beginning. In his monumental work, uh, N.T. Wright's work, The Resurrection of the Son of God, Wright, he, he, he looks at, he analyzes dozens of non-canonical Christian texts, Christian writings that are not in the Bible. From the late first century into the early third century. And he concludes and says, Christianity affirmed in great detail the belief that resurrection involved going through death and into a non-corruptible body on the other side. That it involved one person, the Messiah, being raised from the dead ahead of everybody else and that it allowed for an intermediate state which might best be described in terms of the departed person being with the Lord until the resurrection. Now, he writes in his book, Surprised by Hope, he says, but from the start, within early Christianity, it was built in as part of the belief in resurrection that the new body, though it will certainly be a body in the sense of a physical object occupying space and time, will be a transformed body. A body whose material, created from the old material, will have new properties. Wright goes on and he notes that all of the, the notable medieval theologians, from Gregory the Great in the late 6th, early 7th century, all the way through Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, all of them recognized the importance and significance of bodily resurrection. Wright says mainstream medieval theologians like Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, and Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux, insisted on the bodily resurrection. They, like the New Testament and early church fathers, held a strong view of God's good creation. They knew it must be reaffirmed, not abandoned. Now, Roger Olson is a theologian who teaches at the semin seminary at Baylor, Roger Olson's field of expertise, his specialty, is historical theology. So he's right in the area I'm interested in communicating to you. And Roger Olson writes in his book, The Mosaic of Christian Belief, 
20 centuries of unity and diversity, Olson says the bodily resurrection of all people at some time after death has played a prominent role in Christian teaching throughout history in spite of a pronounced tendency among untutored lay Christians to focus attention on immortality of souls and neglect bodily resurrection the fathers of the church medieval Christian thinkers all the Protestant reformers and faithful modern biblical scholars and theologians have emphasized the bodily resurrection as the blessed hope of believers in Christ he goes on to say now listen to this listen to this he says it would be impossible to discover any single point of greater agreement in the history of Christian thought than this one now this is a guy whose field is historical theology and he says it would be impossible to discover any single point of greater agreement in the history of Christian thought than this one the future bodily resurrection of the dead is the blessed hope of all who are in Christ Jesus by faith over two millennia the church's leaders and faithful theologians have unanimously taught this above the immortality of souls and as more important than some ethereal intermediate state between bodily death and bodily resurrection when the majority of bodily resurrection when Christ returns and yet, as we lamented earlier, it seems that the vast majority of Christians do not know this and neglect belief in bodily resurrection in favor of belief in immediate, post-mortem, heavenly, spiritual existence as ghost-like beings or even angels forever with the Lord in heaven. Now, I think that's true. That, that squares with my experience, is that we have people not just in the church but all over within among uh, Christians believers who hold this idea that's what we talk about I'm gonna go away to heaven I'm gonna go away to heaven uh, it's a Gnostic idea okay it is a Gnostic idea it was the Gnostics that notorious group of heretics in the second century and beyond who insisted on a non-physical eternity because of their conviction that the creation of matter and, and creation itself, that matter was evil, it was in their view the product of a lesser God. Physical creation in their view, it was a prison from which the spirit, the real important thing, the thing that's valuable, from which the spirit needed to be liberated. Matter and creation was a prison. Now, so you know that I'm not making that up. George McRae, who before his death was the dean of Harvard Divinity School, in his chapter, Apocalyptic Eschatology in Gnosticism. So I'm telling you what the Gnostics thought. Here is George McRae who says, What is, of course, most distinctive of the apocalyptic eschatology, eschatology in things, apocalyptic, where we have this sudden uh, inbreaking and finishing things. Okay, so they're talking about the end. What is, of course, most distinctive of the apocalyptic eschatology of Gnosticism is the total absence of any new creation. Given its radically dualistic perspective, Gnostics thought spirit, good, great, pure, matter, bad, evil, dualistic. Okay? So he says, given its radically dualistic perspective expressed in the concept of creation as error. Was something wrong? A lesser God created this mess. Okay? It says, Gnosticism, creation is error. Gnosticism can see the end time only as the dissolution of the created world. Ultimate, the ultimate destiny is the reintegration of the divine particles into God, the dissolution of multiplicity in the restored unity, and with that, the whole cosmos disappears. This is a Gnostic idea. The church historian, Michael Spiegel, he says in his 2014 article that was published in the journal Bibliotheca Sacra, he says, rather than a carefully harvested 
selected reading of the patristic period. This is the early church people. These voices from the second through the fifth centuries actually represent a unified chorus of fathers who shared the view that this created universe would not cease to exist in a final conflagration. Instead, the fires of judgment would purge and purify the present material world, renewing and readying it for eternal life. Indeed, to find contrary voices during the patristic period, okay, that's what the church thought, to find contrary voices during the patristic period, one has to peer across the boundary line of Catholic, small c, Christianity, universal Christianity, and look to the Gnostic heretics who delighted in an eschatology that anticipated the total annihilation of the physical universe. This is not a Christian idea. It is not a Christian view. Christians, you see, the paradise, the story of the Bible is that the paradise that was lost in Genesis is regained in Revelation and regained to a transcendent degree, regained in even greater form. Revelation pictures the restoration of all things that were promised by the prophets. The restoration of all things that were promised. The restoration that's mentioned by Peter in Acts chapter 3 verse 21 the curse that followed sin in Genesis is removed in Revelation the creation that was defiled by sin in Genesis is transformed into the new heavens and new earth you see this picture of the heavenization of fallen creation as heaven and earth merge in Revelation 21 fallen creation gets the ultimate makeover it is, an, it is a, a, an analogous to our resurrection. You see that in Revelation. The tree of life from which mankind was banished because of sin in Genesis is part of the eternal home of the redeemed in Revelation. The continuity is hard to miss. That we have this fall and we have God's working and we have ultimately the restoration and the healing of what was broken. Now the crucial point, the crucial point is that the problem with creation is not its materiality. The problem with creation is not that it is physical. Again, that is a Gnostic perspective. That is not the problem. After all, God is the one who made humans and earth of material substance and then pronounced his physical creation what very good he pronounced it very good rather the problem with creation is the corrupting ruinous effect of sin that was introduced into the human realm into the physical world by Satan through Adam and Eve eliminating creation rather than rescuing it, would mean that Satan had succeeded in damaging God's good creation beyond remedy. As a theologian, Michael Goheen says in his article, Renewed Creation, the End of the Story, he says, in the temptation in the garden, Satan sought to thwart God's plan. Sin and its consequences now touch all of creation. If the presence of sin in the creation leads God to destroy his creation, saving only some human souls, Satan will have gained a tremendous victory. Satan's work will have been quite successful. J.A. Seiss puts it this way, If redemption does not go as far as the consequences of sin, it is a misnomer and fails to be redemption. The salvation of any number of individuals is not the redemption of what fell, but the gathering up of a few splinters. Satan's mischief goes further than Christ's restoration. The story of the Bible moves toward that time when God's restorative work will go as far as Satan's mischief. And he illustrates the point this way. Imagine a child who is healthy in every way, contracts some disease, that begins to have a devastating effect on her body. 
The doctor diagnoses the disease and seeks to prescribe a remedy that will remove the disease and its debilitating effects from her body. The doctor that destroys the patient and proclaims victory over the disease would be a poor doctor indeed. We can speak here of the healing of the creation. God's redemptive remedy has the goal of destroying sin and its effects so that the creation can be healthy again, the way it was supposed to be. Salvation is the healing of the creation, not an escape out of the creation. And I think that's right. Now, many notable figures in the history of churches of Christ subscribed to what I'm telling you. Subscribed to a materialistic eschatology, a physical eternity. Many of them did. That includes Robert Haldane, Alexander Campbell, Moses Lard, David Lipscomb, J.W. McGarvey, James Harding. Uh, do any of those names ring a bell? If you know anything about church history, uh, all of those people subscribe to what I'm telling you. Indeed, it was the dominant perspective in churches of Christ in the late 19th century. This view that I'm sharing with you. But it seems that this eschatological view, this idea of a material, physical eternity, was a casualty of the war over premillennialism that was fought in the church in the 1930s and 40s. Now, though materialistic eschatology, a physical end state, that doesn't entail premillennialism. There are two different things. But as often happens in theological battles, relevant distinctions get cast aside and the new earth baby got thrown out with the premillennial bathwater. That's what, what happened, presumably because both of them involve a material state. And to this day, many in churches of Christ have a reflexive aversion to materialistic eschatology which in my judgment pushes them to unlikely readings of a number of relevant texts and it causes them to speak as though what I'm saying to you is crazy. That it's beyond the theological and exegetical pale. Some of them simply dismiss it with hand, you know, just dismiss it out of hand saying that's Jehovah's Witness doctrine. That's Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Yeah, and it was also the doctrine of all the people here in the Bible and throughout. So, I mean, a blind hog can find an acorn, right? So if the Jehovah's Witnesses understood that, good for them. But that's no answer to it. That's no answer to it. All right. So if what I'm saying, if it's new to you, it is not because it has not been known and accepted from the beginning. It's because it became disfavored in our heritage as collateral damage of a 20th century theological battle. So that's why it seems, if, if you've not heard it, and you think it's odd, what I'm telling you is what's happened. Now, I will say more about the resurrection as we work our way through chapter 15. I know you have questions. What about this? What about this? I will address those as we go through the text. But let me, uh, let me share with you some things. If you're interested in this, I, I have here, if you care what I, how I arrive at this or... or you know, the basis of this, I want to share with you some of the things that I've written on it that'll give you a better understanding. And so here, here are papers at that website. You can find there, if you want to read more about this, you can find here, and if you look at first the subsection in that first paper, the historical case for the resurrection of Christ, if you look at the, in pages five to seven is views of death and the afterlife at the time of Christ, which I summarized for you already here. But you might want to take a look at that. And then after that, you can look at these papers, The Resurrection of the Body, On the Materiality of the Eternal State, A Brief Study of Eschatology, and Some Thoughts on the Intermediate State of the Dead. If you will look at those, if you care, you read those and you will at least have a fuller understanding of why I believe as I do. I have thought this for decades. I have taught it. I'm convinced it's true. But I understand from that. And I know how some of you are looking at me, okay? You think, what, what is this? This sounds like, all right, well, go dig in, okay? Go dig in and, and just read and, and you can have a fuller under explanation of what I'm thinking here. 
Let me end this little detour here, this introduction to chapter 15, with another quote from N.T. Wright. Now, this is from his lecture in November of 2016, titled, Jesus and the Future. Wright says, Israel's story always was about creation and new creation. About God dealing with the corruption that followed from human idolatry and relaunching his project of creation. Now it had happened. New creation had arrived, close up and personal in Jesus Christ. And all this makes it more important than ever that we grasp the reality of bodily resurrection. The word resurrection was never in the first century a generalized word for life after death. That is to say the word resurrection presupposes a two-stage post-mortem reality and the word resurrection refers to the second stage in that sequence. That's what I was telling you. There is you die, there is continuing life after death in the form of the soul or spirit, and then there is life after life after death in the form of bodily resurrection. That's what he means by this two-stage post-mortem reality. God the Creator will make new heavens and new earth a new world that will be more physical, more full of pulsating life than the present one. God loves bodies. God loves... I see some of you just squirming. God loves stuff. He loves the creation. He made this world full of life and power and beauty. And if we look at the world with the jaundiced eyes of a world-weary Platonist, that is the philosophy that informed the Gnostics, if we look at this world with the jaundiced eyes of a world-weary Platonist, we think of it all as rotten, full of change and decay, and must be done away with. We're missing the point. The Jewish hope of resurrection was always for renewed creation. Not the abolition of creation and the establishment of a different sort of thing as though the Creator decided that the first creation was actually a failed experiment and He better do a non-physical one the next time around. So when we're talking about the resurrection, we're talking about bodies, about new creation, about a world and about human beings being more alive than at present. Do you know how when you meet somebody you know who's been, who's been very sick and you see them for the first time after they've been sick, you say, poor old so-and-so, he's just a shadow of his former self? If you're part of Jesus' family, in the Messiah, as Paul puts it, if you are indwelt by the Spirit, you're just a shadow of your future self. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Oh, I really love that. So you're just a shadow of your future self. Okay, uh, here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 11. He says, Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firm to what word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you among the first things, ah, hear that, what also I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, afterward he was seen by over 500 brothers at one time, most of whom re remain until now, but some fell asleep. Afterward, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he was seen by me also. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, but I persecuted, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not in vain. Rather, I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Therefore, whether I or they, thus we preach, and thus you believed. So Paul here, as I noted in that little introduction, maybe not so little, some of the Corinthians, they believed that the eternal state would be non-physical. That Christians who died would not receive a resurrection body, but rather would spend eternity as disembodied spirits. 
They took, they took Philo's view and they took the view that was dominant in the ancient world, uh, in the ancient pagan world. Their Greek worldview, it made them incredulous. You see, this is the, the dominant view of the pagans was you continue as a disembodied soul. And this had infected them and it, this brought them in their worldview, made them incredulous about an eternal physical existence. Which is expressed in these questions in 1535. How are the dead raised? With what sort of body do they come? How does that happen? With what sort of body do they come? And Paul reminds them in this section that the gospel that they heard from him, the gospel that they accepted from him, includes the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the grave. He preached that. They all preached that. And they accepted that. They believe that. And Paul notes that this gospel saves them if they hold firm. If they hold firm. That is, that's a warning that the truth of that message cannot be abandoned without consequences. So Paul tells them, you accepted this truth. And that is something here when he tells them, if you hold firm, they have to continue to believe what God has said about his work in Christ. So he warns him about that and he adds that holding firm to the gospel message that that will save them unless they believed in vain. Unless they believed in vain. If the gospel message was false, if that message was false, which their denial that Christians will be resurrected implied, Paul is going to tell them the implication of your denying that Jesus is merely the first fruits, one of the harvest, to deny the resurrection is implicitly to deny his resurrection. Now, I know people don't see that. I have people say that to me. When I show them Jesus' resurrection body, it's flesh and bones. It's not this flesh and bones. It is reconstituted resurrection flesh and bones. He's no longer subject to death. I say, well, Jesus was different. Jesus was different. Okay, this is what's going on. And Paul says you can't break the nexus. He's the first fruits. And if you break the nexus, you are implicitly denying the other. All right, you'll see that as we go through. Of course, I think you already know that. All right, so Paul says here see, that, that you're denying what, the, if you break that, you're denying what, the, what is implied there. And belief in that gospel, if you do that, then belief in that gospel will profit nothing. In that case, they would have believed in vain. If the gospel's false, well, then you'd have believed in vain. Now, the reason their denial that Christians will be resurrected implied the gospel was false, the reason it did that is, as Paul will make clear in chapter 15, verse 13, what I just said, it implies that Christ was not resurrected. That is the implication. Now they'd say, we don't think it implies that. Paul is telling them it implies that. It implies that. And Christ's resurrection is, of course, a fundamental aspect of the gospel. As Paul would later say in 2 Timothy 2.8, I heard that, let me finish this. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, a descendant of David, according to my gospel. The apostles' preaching in Acts confirms the link between the gospel and and the Lord's resurrection, 2, Acts 2, 3, you know them all. Okay, so you see this. So what Paul is saying that what you aren't seeing is that what you're doing in denying the resurrection of the dead ones, you are implicitly denying the resurrection of Jesus. And that's, I know that's significant, but I think that's what Paul is saying. Thanks for coming.